And what we're going to look at this evening is the treatment of infidels, and also in that we're going to include Christians and Jews. Basically, an infidel is anyone who does not believe in Islam. By definition, they call them an infidel. At face value, as I pointed out, Islam seems to have a lot of similarities with Judaism and Christianity because it is a monotheistic religion. They do believe in a single creator God who is a personal God. They are an Abrahamic religion. So they not only honor Abraham, they honor Adam, Noah, Moses, Solomon, and Jesus, familiar uh, people to us. The difference being Jesus they see as a prophet, whereas we would say he's more than a prophet. They claim to accept the Old and the New Testament writings, though we'll see, um, you know, uh, next week, I think it is, that that comes with a bit of a disclaimer. And they look forward to the return of Jesus, who they call Issa, to judge the earth. But there as well, he's not quite the same Jesus that you and I know. And so the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith are sharply contrasted to the Bible. We saw regarding the status and the treatment of women, but also infidels and other races, in particular Jews. So let's have a quick look at that. So there's just a little cartoon, which I thought was quite funny. You know, ours is a peaceful religion and we'll kill anyone who says otherwise. That's the kind of um, things you might expect to be said. Because in the Quran, both Jews and Christians are considered to be infidels. Surah 930, the Jews claim that Ezra is the son of God, and the Christians say the Messiah is a son of God. Those are their claims which do indeed resemble the sayings of the infidels of old. May God do battle with them, how they are deluded. My footnote there is, I don't know when the Jews ever claimed that Ezra is a son of God. I don't know where they got that from, but... Often, Muhammad was a bit ill-informed. The Quran says that God hates unbelievers, yet the unbelievers worship idols and says the unbeliever is his Lord's enemy. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 verse 8 that God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God loves the sinner. Because in John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his son. In fact, the example that Jesus gave when he instructed us to love our enemies is God himself. Because he said that God blesses the unrighteous with sun and rain. And he says, even pagans love those who love them in return. And so the instruction from Jesus is that we are to love our enemies, that we may be sons of our father in heaven. In terms of finance, with regards to infidels, Muslims are instructed to dominate them by exacting taxes from them. Declare war upon those to whom the scriptures were revealed, but believe neither in God nor the last day. And it says, until they pay the poll tax without reservation and are totally subjugated. So they would have a tax that is exacted on unbelievers. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And meek means humbly patient, docile under provocation from others, submissive. So he doesn't tell us to declare war on the unbelievers. Extortion. Extortion is when you obtain money, property, or services from a person, person using coercion. In fact, Wikipedia, and I think most um, dictionaries, will define it as a criminal activity, where you extort money from someone under duress. But Muslims are told in Surah 9, verse 29, that they ought to fight the people of the book, which is a reference to Jews and Christians, and extort money from them. But when John the Baptist was approached by soldiers, Roman soldiers, and remember they would have the power to extort money, he specifically says to them in Luke 3.14, don't extort money 
and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And the Bible tells us that we mustn't practice extortion or mistreat foreigners by denying them justice in Ezekiel 22 verse 29. There are some other Bible passages on extortion. Proverbs 7, 7, extortion turns a wise man into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. Psalm 62, 10, do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Habakkuk 2, verse 6, woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. So extortion is explicitly prohibited in the Bible. Isaiah as well says, he who walks righteously and speaks what is right, who rejects gain from extortion and keeps his hands from accepting bribes. This is the man who will dwell on the heights. Rather than extorting money from unbelievers, Jesus actually tells us to lend money to an enemy without expecting to get anything back in Luke chapter 6. And he says, this, then your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High because he's kind to the ungrateful and wicked. So he actually tells us to even um, lend to our enemies because he says even sinners lend to those from whom they expect repayment. And we are, he says, to be different than that. Unbelieving family, the Quran says that a Muslim should not befriend unbelievers in the family. Do not befriend your fathers or your brothers if they choose unbelief in preference to faith. But we find that Paul tells Christian spouses to actually stay with their unbelieving partner if, if they prepare to and they don't want to desert you, and that through your good actions to actually lead them to salvation. And Peter actually instructs wives who've got husbands who are not believers, rather than not to be their friends, he tells them, tells them that they should win over the unbelieving husbands by their good behavior and the way they treat them nasty. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Very different. Don't befriend infidels, we are told in Islam. Surah 11.28, let, unbel let believers not make friends with the infidels. Surah 3.118, do not make friends with any men other than your own people. They will spare no pains to corrupt you. Surah 14, we stirred among them, that's the Christians, enemy and hatred, which shall endure to the day of resurrection. Christians and Jews mustn't be befriended. Surah 51, take neither Jews nor Christians for your friends. They are friends with one another. Whoever of you seeks their friendship shall become one of their number. Um, Surah 5, 56 to 64. Do not take as your friends the infidels or those who received the scriptures before you. That's a reference to the Jews and Christians. And you scoff and jest at your religion. But Jesus was called the friend of sinners. Instead of telling us, to hate sinners and not be friends with them. He himself was called the friend of tax collectors and sinners. He saw them as lost sheep that needed to be restored. And when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, because they saw that he had tax collectors and sinners listening to him, they said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep, where he compared that sinner to a sheep that has gone astray, that he came to seek and save. The son of man, he said, came to seek and save the lost. He loved the sinner. 
And when he found it, he joyfully put it on his shoulders and goes home. And he has a party. And he's rejoicing in heaven, he tells us, when one sinner repents. Jesus was criticized for visiting Zacchaeus because he was a tax collector who was known to be a cheat and a sinner. And again, they said he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Should you eat with your enemies? Well, Jesus was a strong critic of the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. But there I've just given you three occasions where it tells us that Jesus went to have dinner with Pharisees. So these people who weren't exactly his friends and often were his mortal enemies, Jesus would even eat with them. So not just the tax collectors and the sinners, he would eat with Pharisees. In fact, a Pharisee came to him at night, Nicodemus, and he wanted to know how he could enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus didn't chase him away, call him an enemy. He told him how he needed to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Even the man who betrays him to death gets greeted with a kiss and Jesus calls him friend. This is the man who had betrayed him. And on the cross, those who had falsely accused him and who were even mocking him, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. What a difference. It's like the world to hate those who are different to you and not in your own little clique. But Jesus eats with the sinners. He compares them to lost sheep. He even forgives those, uh, the one who betrayed him and those who mock him on the cross. The Quran says that infidel Jews, in one instance here, are denied good food. We have forbidden them good and wholesome foods, which were formerly allowed them. But the Bible tells us to feed our enemy if he's hungry, not to deny him food. And if he's thirsty, we are told, give him something to drink. Paul tells Christians that we are free to accept meal invitations from unbelievers without raising questions of conscience about the meal put before them. Uh, this is obviously in the context of uh, meat sacrificed to idols. Now, Christians are cautioned against close fellowship with unbelievers. And we normally apply this in particular to close relationships like a marriage or a business partner because of a lack of common ground. So we are told do not be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common. But we're not told to be enemies with them and not to be their friends. But we are cautioned that it's not advisable for Christians to have a, a close relationship like a woman who marries, uh, a believing woman who marries a husband who's not a believer. And we have to be careful that we're not badly influenced by the company we keep. Um, bad company corrupts good character, it says in 1 Corinthians 15.33. But we are told that as Christians, we're not to judge those outside the church. In terms of jurisdiction, Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. But then he qualifies it. He says he's not meaning the people of the world who are moral or greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Because he says in that case, you'll have to leave the world. He says that you mustn't associate with someone who claims to be a Christian who's sexually immoral or greedy. And he says, do not even eat with such people. What business of mine uh, is it or of mine to judge those outside the church? But he says we do have jurisdiction to judge those inside. So we are told if a man claims to be a believer and yet he is, you know, a drunkard and a slanderer and greedy, that we, sh we should distance ourselves from them. But he says he's not talking about the unbelievers because God is their judge, not ours. And Jesus himself, as we saw, would frequent and have dinner with unbelievers. The Quran says you must be harsh with unbelievers. Let them find harshness in you. Surah 9, 1, 2, 3. Christians are told we must not return evil for evil. 
but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people, not just your friends, not just for Christians. We are told to repay evil with good in Romans 12, 21. And Peter says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay, repay evil with blessing. Jesus told us that if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. The Quran says that unbelievers are the enemies of the Muslim. They're sworn enemies. Surah 9, 4, we renounce you. That's the idolaters. Enmity and hate shall reign between us. Until you believe in Allah only. Now to be fought against. And that includes Jews and Christians. And killed. Kill the infidels. Wherever you find them. Surah 9, 5. Surah 3, 85. If anyone chooses a religion. Other than Islam. It will never be accepted. This is speaking about those who convert to other religions. Kill whoever changes his religion. That is from Islam. Muslims should not punish a Muslim if he kills a non-Muslim, it says in the Hadith. Jesus said we must love our enemies. We must actually pray for them and not pray that God's going to hurt them, but pray for their salvation and that we to respond to their curses with blessing and pray for those, he said, who must treat you. And there's no credit, he said, in being good to those who are good to you, because he said even sinners do that. So by his definition, what he's taught in Islam is just what sinners do anyway. He says even sinners love those who love them and greet those who greet them. Violence, Jesus said, mustn't be reciprocated to with more violence. You've heard that it was said eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. That sort of sounds fair. That was the old covenant law. But Jesus said in the new covenant, he said, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. There are some who say that Islam is a religion of peace. And yet the Quran instructs Muslims to fight against non-believers. Fight against them until idolatry is no more. And Allah's Religion reigns supreme. Fighting is obligatory for you, much as you dislike it. But you may hate a thing, although it's good for you. Surah 941, whether unarmed or well-equipped, march on and fight for the cause of Allah. You to kill unbelievers. Extort, uh, sorry, exhort the believers to fight. If there are 20 steadfast men among you, they shall vanquish 200. Um, unbelievers must be killed. Surah 9, 5 to 6. Kill those who join other gods with God, wherever you may find them. In 1988, I don't know if you will remember that, if you're old enough to. Salman Rushdie published a novel. He was an ex-Muslim. He became an unbeliever, an atheist, I think. And he wrote a book called The Satanic Verses. And Muslims took offense to it. And the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran issued a fatwa against Rushdie. And he offered a hefty bounty for his murder. And that triggered several attacks on the translators and the publishers. And this man pictured over here, who was the Japanese translator, was actually murdered because of a book that was published that was deemed to be inflammatory against Islam. The September 11 attacks, I'm sure you all remember. It was a series of four coordinated terrorist attacks launched by Al-Qaeda against the U.S. And Al-Qaeda is the Islamic terrorist group. 
Four passenger airliners were hijacked by 19 terrorists so they could be flown into buildings in suicide attacks. Bin Laden's declaration of a holy war, jihad against the US, and a 1998 fatwa. A fatwa is basically where one of their religious leaders, one of their imams, makes some sort of a pronunciation, as we saw with Salman Rushdie, that he must be killed or yeah, this fatwa that's declared against the United States. Theodor van Gogh was a Dutch film director. And he worked with a Somali-born writer to produce a film submission which criticized the treatment of women in Islam. And as we saw last time, there's a lot of room for criticism. And based on that, in 2004, he was assassinated by a Dutch Moroccan Muslim. I'm sure you remember the controversy with the Dutch, uh, the Danish cartoonist pictured over here, who drew a picture of uh, Muhammad in a cartoon. I think the cartoon had Muhammad with a bomb under his turban. And obviously they took offense to that. And while it might have been very disrespectful of him, again, they tried to murder him. In 2010, after uh, he and his wife, um, you know, had an attack on his life, um, there was a Somali man who forced his way into their, uh, their home, wielding an axe and a knife and attempted to kill him. And he had to, you know, following that, spend months on the run. So there again was another cartoon referring to that where this imam is saying, looks, looks like I'll have to change my sermon from Allah is kind, compassionate and loving to get out and kill the infidel Danish editorial cartoonist. According to Reuters in 2014, Judge Lahore Gulam Mutaza Chaudhry sentenced Sawan Masi to hang. But by the way, whenever the surname is Masi, it indicates the person's a Christian because they all effectively are given the same surname. To hang after a Muslim said that he'd insulted the Prophet Muhammad a year ago. The accusation against Masi sparked a riot in which Muslims burned more than 100 Christian homes. Today, the judge announced his verdict and said that Sawan must be hanged and fined. At least 16 people are on death row in Pakistan for blasphemy, and at least 20 others are serving life sentences. Now, the same article from Reuters says that as of yet, no one has been executed for blasphemy, although they've been put on death row. But it appears that many of these accusations are even frivolous because the law doesn't require evidence to be pre presented and there's no penalties for false allegations. So you can make an allegation that a Christian insulted Muhammad, so you don't even have to prove it. Because courts often hesitate to hear the evidence because they fear that reproducing it will be considered blasphemous. We are told in Romans 12, 17 to 19, that we not to seek revenge, that we entrust justice to God. We not, must not repay evil for evil. As far as possible, live at peace with anyone. Do not take revenge. Because God says it's mine to avenge. I will repay. And we are told in 1 Peter 2 verse 2 that we must live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. <clears throat> on the day he visits us. You recall when Jesus wanted to go through a Samaritan village and they wouldn't let him because they obviously knew that he and his disciples were Jews. Well, he was headed to Jerusalem and James and John, two of his disciples that Jesus nicknamed the sons of thunder, presumably because of their fiery tempers, they said to Jesus, why didn't we call down fire on this village? Burn them up. And it says that Jesus rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you're of.
if a Muslim doesn't battle against infidels, they'll be punished by God and sent to hell. If you do not fight, he will punish you severely and put others in your place. And in this other surah, when you meet the unbelievers preparing for battle, do not turn your backs on them. Anyone who does shall incur the wrath of God and hell shall be his home. And there's a reward promised for those who die while fighting for the cause of Islam. As for those who are slain in the cause of Allah, it says here in Surah 10, he will not allow their works to perish. He will vouchsafe them guidance and ennoble their, their state. He will admit them to paradise. And they are promised a handsome reward. The Bible tells us that if you die and your motivation is not love, you gain nothing. We are told that even if we surrender our body to the flames and the motivation is not love, you gain nothing. No promise of a reward. And it's not commendable to kill others. In fact, Jesus says it's commendable to give up your life for a friend. My command is this, he said in John 15, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one in us that he lay down his life for his friends, not that you go and kill the infidels. He has the journalist Daniel Pearl. He was not only American, he was a Jew. And he was kidnapped by Pakistani militants and later beheaded. And he was a reporter for the Wall Street, Street Journal. And often you find in these cases where they behead them, they also, you know, take pictures and, and videos of them doing it and they post it on social media, which is just disgusting. And if you thought that cartoon I put up earlier was going a bit far, well, look at this post here. Behead those who say Islam is violent. I mean, don't they see the irony? But acts like what was done to Daniel Pearl are sanctioned in the Quran. Surah 47, 4 to 15. When you meet the unbelievers in the battlefield, strike off their heads. Surah 8, 12. I will instill terror into the hearts of the infidels, strike off their heads then and strike off from them every fingertip. And in the 1990s, obviously since um, this particular article, which was titled An African Asks Some uh, Disturbing Questions of Islam, Subsequent to that, Sudan has split, and you do get the northern southern part now, where the southern part is predominantly Christian and the northern part is predominantly Muslim. But in the fighting that ensued in the 1990s, thousands of Christians and unbelievers died, many by crucifixion or by having their hands and feet on alternate sides cut off. Now, is it coincidental that that the Quran sanctions this very practice. Surah 533, the only reward of those who make war upon Allah and his messenger and strive after corruption in the land will be, will be that they will be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet on alternate sides cut off. We are told when we hear of these things, well, those guys were just extremists. Well, it sounds to me like they're doing what it tells them to do in the holy book, that they're not extremists. Not by, uh, you know, what is written in the Quran. They're just following it. 2010, this man pictured over here, who was a professor in India. He had his hand chopped off by a Muslim mob because they accused him of blasphemy. Don't show mercy to captives. Rather slaughter them, we are told in the Quran. But Jesus said, we must love our enemies and be merciful. And we are told that when the Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Blessed, Jesus said, are the merciful in his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So rather than declaring holy wars and telling us to chop off the hands and feet and heads of infidels, we are told to love our enemies. And so in this, the second part on anti-Semitism, and this we see so much uh, today in the news, we had this terrible terrorist attack that was uh, perpetrated by Hamas against Israel. And yet so many in the world, not even just the Muslims, our own country is one of the worst. They immediately jumped to the defense of the terrorists after they'd gone in and killed children, they actually beheaded children and babies and raped women and filmed themselves doing it. And yet our leaders defend them. Now, Ishmael, who was the forefather of the Arabs, and obviously Islam comes from the Arabs, and they actually brother races because both Isaac and Ishmael were brothers. They had um, uh, Abraham as their father. And we see that Ishmael's mother, Hagar, was told by the angel that he would live in conflict by his brother with his brothers. In Genesis 16. And so the angel says to Hagar, you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. But the angel says his hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. And this ancient prophecy we see fulfilled. Where Ishmael and Isaac are brother races. And yet the hatred and enmity that exists there. And as I said, Ishmael's descendants, the Arab races, still live in hostility, even among themselves. The Sunni and the Shiite um, divisions within Islam hate each other almost as much as they hate Jews and Americans. But they are united by one thing, and that's the hatred for Jews and Americans. Now, when the Jews in Medina, um, Muhammad operated very much in Mecca and then also Medina. That's why they're considered to be the two most holy cities of Islam. And there were Jews in Medina at the time. And when they first heard about the coming of a prophet who was teaching monotheism, belief in one God, they were intrigued because the pagans, uh, Arabs at that time, were predominantly polytheistic. They were worshipping multiple idols. And so they didn't immediate, immediately accept or rejected him, reject him. They wanted to know more. But the relations started to deteriorate when they found out that Muhammad was not very familiar with their scriptures and traditions. And the, the rabbis would then actually taunt him with questions that he could not answer, which obviously he took offense to. But we see that, that, that Muhammad clearly had very little knowledge of the scriptures, even though he claimed to, to know them and endorse them. And Muhammad was obviously disappointed by this because he thought he was preaching the same monotheism and he thought that the Jews would accept him as a prophet, but they didn't. And to try and get their favor, he even borrowed some of their practices. And Muslims were instructed to meet for prayer on Friday afternoon, just as the Jews prepare, prepare for the Sabbath in the Friday evening. And he told them that when they pray, they were to face Jerusalem, as many Jews do when they pray. They were to observe some of the Jewish dietary laws, as well as fast on the Day of Atonement. But... When the Jews still rejected him, he got annoyed with them and he decided to change the direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca. So it was changed because he was annoyed that the Jews called him a false prophet. Now there are several incidents that are recorded in Islamic histories and the Hadith which demonstrate Muhammad's cruel and unforgiving 
behavior towards the Jews then. So he certainly held a grudge. And he has been criticized for the massacre of a Jewish tribe of Medina. The tribe was accused of having engaged in treasonous agreements with the enemies besieging Medina in the Battle of the Trench in 67. Ibn Ishaq writes that Muhammad approved the beheading of some 600 to 900 individuals who surrendered unconditionally. Trenches were dug and the men were de beheaded and their decapitated corpses buried in the trenches while Muhammad watched in attendance. Women and children were sold into slavery, a number of them being distributed as gifts among Muhammad's companions. And in fact, he even chose one of them as one of his many wives. Their property and possessions, including weapons, were also divided up as additional booty among the Muslims to support further jihad campaigns. It seems that Muhammad was quite okay with the use of torture because another controversial story, which once again doesn't come from his enemies, it comes from Muslims, was an attack on a Jewish settlement called Kaaba. After its last fort was taken by Muhammad and his men, the chief of the Jews was asked by Muhammad to reveal the location of some hidden treasure. And when the man refused, Muhammad ordered a man to torture him. And the man kindled a, kindled a fire with flint and steel on his chest until he was nearly dead. Kinana was then beheaded. And again, Muhammad took his young wife as one of his own wives. Contrast that with Jesus. The Hadith says that it's the duty of Muslims to kill Jews in the end times. This is from the Hadith. The day of resurrection will not arrive until the Muslims make war against the Jews and kill them. And until a Jew hiding behind a rock and tree, and the rock and tree will say, O oh Muslim, O oh servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. The New Testament says this about Jews, the end times. In Romans 11, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced the hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. That's Jesus comes from Jerusalem. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So rather than being told to kill the Jews in the last time, we are told that Jesus is going to come to deliver them and to liberate Jerusalem. Nazi sympathy, something that's conveniently forgotten. In fact, again, ironically, there's some people who try to make comparisons between the state of Israel and Nazism, when it was actually the Muslims who supported the Nazis, especially in their murder of Jews. Have a look at some of those posters. God bless Hitler. Jews haven't learned supposedly they need and there's a swastika more than before i'll buy some little child now the grand mufti is the highest official of religious law in a sunni uh, or ibadi muslim country, uh, country. and from 1921 uh, muhammad amin al-husaini was the grand mufti of jerusalem so he was the chief religious leader but he used that position to promote Israel, Islam and to uh, pursue very anti-Semitic policies. In 1937, he expressed his solidarity with Germany. And he asked the Nazi Third Reich of Hitler to oppose the establishment of the Jewish state, to stop Jewish immigration to Palestine and provide arms to the Arab population. According to documentation that we have from the Nuremberg and the Eichmann trials, 
the SS, the brutal killers of the uh, the Nazi regime, helped finance Al Husseini's efforts in the 1936 to 39 revolt in Palestine. And in fact, Adolf Eichmann actually visited Palestine and met with Al Husseini at the time, and maintained regular contact with him later in Berlin. And there's a picture of the Scar, the chief leader of um, Islam in Jerusalem, uh, Al Husseini, meeting with Adolf Hitler in 1941. He was uh, Hitler's special guest in Berlin, and he advocated the extermination of the Jews in a radio, radio broadcast back to the Middle East, and recruiting Balkan Muslims for the famous SS mountain divisions that tried to wipe out Jewish communities throughout the region. Okay, I won't read that. Time's a bit short. There's a picture of him with Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the SS. The guys in charge of the extermination camps where six million Jews would lose their lives in the Holocaust. And here we have this leader, this Islamic leader, shaking hands with him. And in fact, at the Nuremberg trials, Eichmann's deputy, who was subsequently executed as a war criminal, testified the Mufti was one of the initiators of the systematic extermination of European Jewry and had been a collaborator and an advisor of Eichmann and Himmler in the execution of this plan. Eichmann was the one who carried it out. Himmler and, you know, in, obviously together with Hitler, decreed it, and Eichmann was the man who, you know, effectively carried out their plans. He was one of Eichmann's best friends and had constantly incited him to accelerate the extermination measures. I heard him say, accompanied by Eichmann, that he visited incognita the gas chamber of Auschwitz. So he was not unaware of what was happening. In fact, he visited Auschwitz and approved of what was happening. In fact, one German officer noted in his journals that the Mufti would have liked to have seen the Jews preferably all killed. On a visit to Auschwitz, he reportedly admonished the guards running the gas chambers to work more diligently. And in September 1943, when there were intense negotiations to try and rescue 500 Jewish children from the Arb concentration camp, the whole thing collapsed because he objected. And the reason for his objection is he was worried that ultimately they might end back in Palestine. And he didn't want 500 Jewish children there, so he rather let them get killed in a concentration camp. There's Heinrich Himmler, chief of the Nazi SS. Islam is very similar to our worldview. In 1943, the Mufti recommended to the Hungarian minister that it would be better to send Jews in Hungary to concentration camps in Poland rather than let them find asylum in Palestine. And the bottom line is he was fully aware of what was happening in the extermination camps and had no problem with it and would rather that happen than Jews be let out and potentially go to Palestine. In fact, Gilbert Echol, when he referred to a meeting with the Mufti and Himmler, observes that the Mufti was not only aware of what was happening to the Jews, he actually gloated about it. And this is, once again, ironic, because you get some Muslims today who try to deny that the Holocaust happened. And yet this prominent leader among the Muslims actually gloated that the Jews had paid a much higher price than the Germans in the war. And he said their losses in the Second World War represent more than 30% of the total number of their people. March 1944, while speaking on Radio Berlin, he said, Arabs, rise as one man and fight for your sacred rights. Kill the Jews wherever you find them. 
Notice what he's quoting there? He's quoting the Hadith. This pleases God, history and religion. This saves your honor. God is with you. And here's an excerpt from Adolf Hitler, where he actually shows a preference for Islam over Christianity, because obviously Christianity is supposed to love your enemy. And he said, if Charles Martel had not been victorious at Poitiers, that was, he's referring to Charles Martel, he was the Frank King, that when the Muslims were advancing on Europe, he managed to drive them back. We know that the Muslims in their jihads, they took North Africa, they took the Middle East, they tried to take Europe. In fact, they took parts of Europe and were driven out. And so thank God to Charles, Mart for Charles Mattel. If it wasn't for him, we'd all be speaking Arabic. And he drove them out. And he said, yeah, if Charles Mattel had not been victorious, he said, we have already taken on the Jewish world. Christianity is somewhat stale. We would much rather have accepted Mohammedanism. This doctrine of rewarding heroism, the warrior alone gets the seventh heaven. The Germans would have conquered the world with it. Only through Christianity have we been held back from doing so. So it's bemoaning the fact that Europe didn't go Muslim and that Charles Mattel actually won because he said they would have done better as Muslims. At a mosque in Sudan in 2007, this is what the acting speaker of the Palestinian Legislative Council, Sheikh Ahmed Bar, said, You will be victorious, while America and Israel will be annihilated, Allah willing. They are cowards who are eager for life, while we are eager for death for the sake of Allah. O oh Allah, vanquish the Jews and their supporters. O oh Allah, vanquish the Americans and their supporters. O oh Allah, count their numbers and kill them all down to the very last one. And people tell me, well, Christianity and Islam have a lot in common. And we've got a lot of common ground. I don't think so. In 2013, these two Jewish-British teenagers working as volunteer teachers in an orphanage for Muslim children in Tanzania, in the Zanzibar region, had acid thrown at them by men riding on a motorbike. They were there to help Muslim orphans, these Jewish girls, leaving them with facial chest and back injuries. One of the girls had earlier been accosted for singing during Ramadan. Two Christian leaders were killed early in the year in separate attacks. I'm just giving you a few isolated instances. The Quran relates a story which was borrowed from an Arabian fable of a village of Jews who were supposedly turned into apes and pigs because they broke the Sabbath by fishing. And it was the subject of an Islamic fatwa in Germany. And um, the fatwa is entitled The Reincarnation of the Sons of Israel in the Bodies of Apes and Pigs. The question asked was, in the Holy Quran, it is written that Allah reincarnated the souls of some of the Jews in the bodies of apes. Did apes exist before the Jews? And are there any relics of the Jews who became apes today? And so, effectively, the answer is that what he said there is correct. That the punishment for not keeping the Sabbath was that Allah turned these Jews into apes and pigs. And there's a three-year-old Muslim girl on TV in Saudi Arabia saying that the Jews are apes and pigs. That's what they taught. And he even got this bright guy who wrote a book producing scientific evidence for the fatwa's claim that the Jews are the descendants of apes and pigs. And he shows pictures of Jewish bodies with tails. And this is his evidence, apparently, that Jews come from apes and pigs. 
And here's that will explain this anti-Semitic cartoon where effectively uh, the interview there is asking the apes and pigs and they're crying because they've been compared to Jews. Former Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi, who was a member of the Islamic uh, Muslim Brotherhood, was criticized when there was a video that surfaced where he called Jews and Zionists bloodsuckers and the descendants of apes and pigs. This isn't even, you know, uh, this is effectively what these guys are taught. And so, in closing, I believe, and I think that's fairly evident, I've just given a brief summary here, that the status and the treatment of infidels or unbelievers in Islam is sharply contrasted to the Christian model. They're not even slightly similar. Effectively, in Islam, the rulers do not befriend or associate with any infidel, Jew or Christian. Rather, you should extort money from them. You should torture them mutilate them, behead or kill unbelievers. Christianity, we are told to befriend the sinner, to assist them financially if they need money, to pray for them, to forgive them, and to show them mercy. There's no common ground there. And so Muhammad claimed to be a prophet of God, and Jesus warned about false prophets. And he said, they come to you in a sheep's clothing. And so Muhammad came, claiming that he was going to restore monotheism, which sounds good. And he was going to punish those who were worshipping idols. And uh, On the surface, that's why even the Jews, as I say, initially thought that maybe there was something to it, until they actually saw how ignorant he was of scripture. But Jesus says, they come, these false prophets in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. And Jesus said, you'll recognize these false prophets by their fruit. Do you pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from a thistle? And Jesus said, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them, recognize you're a false prophet. I want to ask you, does that sound like good fruit? To kill your enemy? to charge them exorbitant interest, not to give them food if they're hungry, not to pray for them. If you get the chance to mutilate them or kill them, is that good fruit? Well, Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know the prophet. And that if you're picking bad fruit, you're talking about a false prophet.